All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. First of all, thank you so much, everyone who took the time to come here and uh, be here for this. Thank you for everyone that's watching online. Uh, my name is Ben Adams. But before I talk about myself, I just want all the students to know that there will be pizza in the foyer uh, after <laughs> this event is over. <laughs> yeah. So my name is Ben Adams. Uh, I am uh, a student here at Boise State in the School of Public Service. Uh, I am a member of the Boise State Political Science Association. I served five years in the Marine Corps. I did two tours uh, to Afghanistan in 2011 and then again in 2012. And I really appreciate all of you coming out for this. So I'm going to introduce our first two speakers. Uh, we'll be hearing from Price Robinson. He is president of the Boise State College Republicans, and he is also the host of Crossing the Aisle. And after that, we will hear from Joe Good. Uh, he has served as the Boise State Young Democrats president for the last three years. Uh, he also serves as the college chapter chair for the last two years. Outside of school, Joe is an activist and also a political uh, organizer for Idaho Democrats. Price. Well, uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out today. I know it takes a lot of effort to, to get out and come to events like this, and I, I'm happy we have a good turnout overall. I want to say thank you to Ben and Dan and all of our, our featured speakers tonight for coming out and talking about something that they really do passionately care about, which is something, once again, is hard to find people like that on, on this campus. And in my personal opinion, there's a little bit of political apathy, so having a, a, or a room full of students at 6 o'clock at night on a Wednesday is something I like to see. And, and overall, I just want to say the issue we're talking about tonight is not a Democratic issue, it's not a Republican issue, it's an American issue. The Constitution grants Congress the right to declare military engagements, uh, whether you're talking about war, deployment of troops overseas, the approval of treaties, yada, yada, yada. It's a congressional issue. It's not a presidential issue. And as Republicans, and as being the president of the Boise State College Republicans, one of the goals that we, or one of the, the ideals that we hold is the value of the Constitution and going through the congressional process in order to get things like military approval for overseas conflict, deployment of troops, passing of budgets, all these things that are outlined in the Constitution. So as a result, we, we think, and we're fully in line with President Trump's view, that we should get out of these overseas engagements that we do not have any sort of geopolitical goal in, or pardon me, any sort of geopolitical um, interests in actually going out there and trying to achieve, when in reality, we actually need to come bring these troops home, look at what's going on in our own backyard, look at what we're doing with our veteran community, look at what kind of things we're spending money on here in this country at home and abroad. So I, I think, and I've gotten a little bit of pushback from some people on the right and the left when it comes to this issue, they say, oh no, you, you just sound like a you know, peace-loving hippie, what are you talking about? You don't want to actually go out and you know, stop the president and have his ability to declare war. That's not the case at all. The Constitution and, and Congress through the War Powers Act, grants the president 90 days to deploy, 60 days to deploy military troops and a 30-day withdrawal process. So the ability to, do, to deploy troops and protect America's interests at home and abroad is available to the president at all points. We just think for these prolonged military engagements that if we could actually go through the process, get congressional approval, and you know, go, go through the Constitution that we can make a really positive impact. So I don't want to take up all your time. I want to give the time to the, the speakers for tonight. So thank you so much. Uh, if you have any interest in looking into the College Republicans, talk to, me after this or, uh, talk to me after this event. I'd be more than happy to give you some information. And make sure to like the Facebook page for bringourtroopshome.org. Thank you so much. Hey, how's it going? My name is Joe. Um, Actually, not the college president or the president of the uh, Boise State Young Democrats anymore. So we we had our elections last week. Uh, so just want to give a shout out to Ivy Smith for uh, she's going to be taking over my position. Um, and um, yeah, obviously, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, you know, this may not be the the turnout you all were expecting, but you know, at the end of the day, our voices are really loud. And I think we have 30 people in this room. I counted if all 30 of these people go out and tell 10 other people about this cause, that is really powerful. 
You know, you, we don't need to have 300 people in here. We could have our voices heard by letting people know about this important issue. Um, I first want to digress a little bit and say that um, with the busy schedule for um, our club, we haven't been able to uh, discuss this matter uh, about bringing our troops home. But that's why I'm so excited to be having this meeting tonight so we could hear um, and, and later discuss uh, what our opinions are. Uh, me as a Democrat, I am fully supportive of bringing our troops home. Um, and I don't think I really had an opinion on this uh, before I met Dan. Uh, that's why I appreciate so much about Dan is because when he reached out to me, he said it wasn't about how your club could help my cause. It was how can my cause help your club and how can we join together to build a community? And that is powerful. And that's why I'm so grateful too that we do have an opportunity to join with the college Republicans in a bipartisan effort to have our voices be heard. Because we could have a strong grassroots fight on one side of the aisle, but if we join on both sides of the aisle and make sure our voices are heard loud and clear, that's a lot more powerful and effective. And um, going back to my point where I didn't really have an opinion on this, I think that's the more important part uh, for us is that we go out and tell people about them or we tell people about this and we educate people because this is an issue that matters this is like you said price it's an american issue i view it as a humanitarian issue we talk a lot about supporting our troops but we haven't seen any initiatives taken to actually do that um, and that doesn't mean just bringing them home it also means taking care of them when they're home making sure they have um, all the opportunities they have to live a healthy life. And um, anyways, thank you all for coming out tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Price. Our next speaker is Tammy Nichols. She is the Republican representative from District 11B and is serving her first term as a state representative. Tammy was born and raised in Boise, graduating from Boise High School and later BYU-Idaho. She is a mother of five children and an active volunteer in the community and her church. She serves as the precinct committeeman for Precinct 1139 in Canyon County. Tammy. Good evening. Thank you for having me um, tonight. As it was said, we, I am a representative in my first term and we just finished up the session. It was an exciting session and uh, a lot of things were accomplished and weren't accomplished. So uh, depending on how you'd like to look at it, you were either successful or we weren't. So, um, but anyway, I am so glad to be here tonight and I am grateful for the words that have already been spoken. Um, I echo those remarks and I appreciate this opportunity to bring um, this information and the ability to have this conversation on this important issue. Uh, I have long believed that our time uh, that our military has spent overseas, especially in um, the Middle East, is long overdue. That uh, we had a time and a place and a purpose for when we were there, but that time has now passed um, because we can't be the world's police for eternity. So, um, so Dan has done a great job getting things put together, and so tonight I wanted to talk about a resolution that has been uh, put together for um, people to be able to support as well as our representatives on both the state and national level to be able to support. And I wanted to read it to you. It's not very long, but I think what it says is important. Um, and then I want you to think as I'm reading this, if this is something that you can support. Our Lieutenant Governor is also supporting this, so um, Dan and I and several others are working with her um, because she believes that this is an important issue as well. So it says, whereas the United States military has now been fighting in the Middle East over 18 years, more than 7,000 American heroes have given their lives and more than 52,000 Americans have been wounded. Whereas the United States has spent over $7 trillion fighting in Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, and Syria. Whereas President Donald Trump said in his 2019 State of the Union address, 
Quote, great nations do not fight endless wars. Our troops have fought with unmatched valor, and thanks to their bravery, we are now able to pursue a political solution to this long and bloody conflict. We do not know whether we will achieve an agreement, but we do know that after two decades of war, the hour has come to at least try for peace. Now, as we work with our allies to destroy the remnants of ISIS, it is time to give our brave warriors a warm welcome home, end quote. And I continue, whereas Idaho citizens have grown weary of war and are eager for peace, whereas the Constitution of the United States of America enumerates the authorization to declare war belonging solely to the U.S. House of Representatives, whereas the last time the U.S. House of Representatives formally approved a declaration of war was in December of 1941, and we should return to the principle that American troops should be committed to combat operations overseas only with congressional authorization is required by the Constitution of the United States. Whereas the U.S. Armed Forces' purpose is defined by Section 3062 of Title 10, U.S. Code is to preserve the peace and security and provide for the defense of the United States, the commonwealths and possessions of the United States. Whereas the mission of the United States military in the forever wars in the Middle East has evolved into nation building, peacekeeping, advising and consulting and occupation. Whereas those who oppose withdrawing American troops from the Middle East assert that our troops cannot be withdrawn perpetuously, but also cannot be withdrawn on some future date specific, whereby leaving no time or plan for withdrawal meanings and endless commitment to spilling American blood and treasure in such conflicts. Therefore, be it resolved that the members of the United States Senate and the Idaho House of Representatives in session do hereby call on our congressional delegation to advocate for and vote in favor of legislation and resolutions that call for the withdrawal of the United States troops from the Middle East and ending the war in Afghanistan. Be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution shall be transmitted to the office of Senator Jim Risch, Chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and to the offices of Senator Mike Crapo, Congressman Mike Simpson, and Congressman Russ Fulcher. So that is our resolution that we have. And what I would like to see is for each of the precincts in the state of Idaho to be able to support this resolution. So over the summer, that's one of my goals, is to be able to go to them and to ask them to support this resolution so that we can get as many behind it as possible. And then we hope that our, our um, congressmen and our senators will also be able to support this as well as our local state officials. So if you can help us with that, what I need you to do is to be able to contact your representatives and your senators and also find out who your precinct committee men are because in each district it's divided into precincts. So you have several precincts that are available and you usually have someone that's filling those seats. So if you can help us with that effort and I have information, you can contact me. Um, I just live in Canyon County, so I'm not too far away, but um, let me know. You can get a hold of me through many different forms, but that is what I need you to do so that we can help in this effort because now is the time to do this. It's long past, and we need to be able to bring our troops home to support them here and take care of them um, because they've done a lot for us, our brave men and women that have been over for many, many years doing a job that needs to end. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Representative Nichols. Appreciate that. Our next speaker is a former congressman, uh, Larry LaRocco, is a prominent Democrat in the state of Idaho. Mr. LaRocco served two terms in the U.S. House of Representatives from Idaho's first congressional district. He served in the U.S. Army as a commissioned officer and, achieving, and achieved the rank of captain. After his military service, he worked for Idaho Senator Frank Church and was the coordinator for Senator Church's presidential campaign. Mr. LaRocco is now a professor at Boise State University. Mr. LaRocco, please. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sort of an adjunct professor, actually. I, I team teach with uh, your dean of the School of Public Service, uh, uh, Corey Cook, and I'm lucky enough to be on campus and spend time with, with students here, and I've, I've enjoyed that very much. Uh, thank you so much for the uh, invitation, uh, Representative Nichols. I don't think we've met, and I'm delighted to be here with you tonight, and, and uh, thank you so much for your remarks. Um, 
I was so enthused to be here tonight because of the bipartisanship that uh, has been shown. Um, we need more of that, uh, Bryce and, and uh, Joe. Uh, I commend you for what you're doing. I know you have a radio program, but uh, um, think of all the things that could be uh, resolved in this country if they had the same attitude and same spirit that, that you two have in, in terms of working together on campus here. So I really applaud you for um, bringing us together tonight, and thank you again for your invitation. Um, I was fortunate enough to uh, be one of about 11,000 Americans that have served in the United States Congress. And um, um, I took that uh, honor and privilege seriously, and uh, uh, it was for the best years of my life to have an opportunity to, to represent this great state in the Congress of the United States. Because the Alumni Association of, uh, uh, of members of Congress is, is very, very small. Um, I also had the opportunity, as uh, Dan mentioned, to work for Senator Frank Church. Uh, I was on his staff for six years, and uh, like many members of Congress, they had some Hill experience. Um, this subject tonight that we're talking about had real resonance for me uh, in thinking about my time that I had worked for Senator Church, and I thought that I would point out three instances where I thought that bipartisanship, um, the um, concern about the Constitution, and the vision for the future, um, um, and how the War Powers Act uh, would be used, uh, come into play. Uh, the first thing was Senator Church, um, being a Democrat, um, um, he opposed the war uh, to uh, Senator or to President um, uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson. It caused a great strain in the relationship, but Senator Church thought that the Vietnam War should end, and um, he, uh, uh, like you all, uh, put together a resolution in the Congress of the United States to, de uh, to defund the war. He was uh, the author with a Republican to stop the, the bombing in Cambodia. So this bipartisanship at a time during the war when we just felt that we had to call enough is enough was very important. And he had the political courage to stand up to his own party and say, it is time to come home, just the same as you are doing. The other thing that Senator Church did uh, was that he cha chaired a committee looking at the intelligence community because we found that we were spying on our own citizens and uh, misbehaving overseas. In the news today, you might uh, recall hearing about these FISA, F-I-S-A, um, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance um, Act, warrants and so forth. They've been brought up in the Mueller investigation and what was happening during the um, uh, campaign in 2016. Um, Senator Church, uh, in a bipartisan way, was able to uh, pass uh, a law that took a new look at the way that we considered uh, the way that we acted towards our own citizens. And uh, that's uh, been somewhat forgotten. But when you read about the FISA warrants and so forth and setting up a regime for judges to um, actually look at uh, the, the facts uh, before we actually uh, take a look at uh, the activities of American citizens that was done during the church committee. The third thing that's in the news today that I think is pretty interesting is the um, emergency powers uh, that have been used by the president uh, south of the border. Um, Senator Frank Church was the, uh, of Idaho was the uh, author with a Republican, Mac Mathias of uh, Maryland, in making sure uh, that uh, there wouldn't be frivolous use of um, executive power. And so that's why we have this law in the books right now, because there were many times where there were emergency powers that were misused by the presidents. So this regime was set up, and it was intended not to have um, this frivolous uh, use of power, and that if there was an emergency, that it'd be essential to our national interests. So uh, those are some things that got me thinking about bipartisanship, uh, what was happening on the, on the foreign uh, stage, and the good work that Dan and, and his people are doing. So basically, as, as Representative Nichols mentioned, this all gets back to the Constitution. There's no question about that. If you believe in the Constitution, then you believe in what uh, uh, this meeting is all about. Because, I mean, it's Article 1, Section 8, Clause uh, 11 of the U.S. Constitution. It says that Congress uh, is the only body that can uh, declare war. 
And as uh, has been mentioned, um, we have not had a declared war since 1941. In my own history, um, I was faced uh, about 20 days after I was sworn into uh, office as a congressman of having to vote to go to war on the Persian Gulf. And um, during the 1990 election, when I was elected, we talked a lot about timber supply. And we talked a lot about flag burning. And we talked a lot about uh, maybe a woman's right to choose. And we talked about public lands issues. But we never talked about war. But 20 days afterwards, we, uh, I was uh, sworn in, we had a vote on whether we should uh, uh, put together the coalition with um, President Bush and um, go to war and keep Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. So my first vote was not on timber supply and uh, it wasn't on other issues that maybe we had talked about on the ground here. It was talked about going to war. So here's how I approached that because I think it, it, it um, really relates to what we're talking about today. Is that um, I'm a veteran. I served during the Vietnam War. I want to be very clear, I did not serve in Vietnam. I was on orders twice for Vietnam, but I was stationed in Germany dealing with Warsaw Pact nations. We actually um, had a couple wars going on, the Cold War and then the Hot War in Vietnam. Um, but I, as a military intelligence officer, um, and having studied international affairs, I took a very hard look at this because uh, the Vietnam War impacted my life um, quite dramatically because it, it disrupted our lives uh, and, it, and uh, we were torn apart as a nation. So as we looked at the Middle East and the vote that I was facing to go to war in the Persian Gulf War, I was very cautious about it, mainly because I saw what can start and not end and that we start down a path, and I thought this quagmire in the Middle East might be sort of a, a false summit. Uh, it might give us false confidence. It might mire us in a conflict and an engagement uh, in a place that maybe we couldn't extract ourselves from. And so I voted against the war, and I thought that in conservative Idaho that maybe I would just cast my first vote and you can identify with this Representative Nichols where you just go, it's over. You know, the people of, of Idaho are gonna say, this guy um, did, did not wanna do the right thing. But Idahoans are conservative when it comes to foreign engagement. They're very conservative. Where they're not conservative, well, where they are very patriotic, at, they will support the troops. As soon as we deploy, we will support the troops. And that's what we all did. But I voted against the war. The resolution that I supported calling for more diplomacy and greater sanctions failed. And, um, and sure enough, the Persian Gulf War, Desert Storm, was an easy uh, victory for us out in the desert. But once we got into Iraq and Baghdad, it gave us false confidence. I believe and admired us in, in that conflict that this group, Dan's group, is trying to extract us from at this point. And so um, what is war? War is the end of diplomacy. It's when diplomacy fails. That's when war starts. And, and I wanted to give diplomacy uh, a chance. Um, We've discussed the Emergency Powers Act um, uh, a little bit, but uh, it's the War Powers Act from 1973 that it really comes into play here. And so the other day, it wasn't too long ago, that the House and the Senate voted to extract the American uh, involvement in Yemen. And uh, in a bipartisan way, this passed the House and it passed the Senate. It passed the House 247 to 175. It passed the, seven, uh, the Senate 54 to 46. So this was a bipartisan resolution that said we would not be involved in Yemen with the Saudis because of what was going on in, in Yemen and how we were disrupting that, uh, that culture and that country. And Americans felt strongly about this under the War Powers Act. That, uh, those resolutions were, um, were vetoed by the president and uh, there, was, there weren't enough votes to override the veto. But what we're talking about is the constitutional power by the president where he th believes that he can uh, uh, determine when we go to war. So I think what we're really discussing here and the importance of this discussion on campus, the, the importance of this discussion between both of our parties as citizens is whether we are defending the Constitution. I think it's a very clear case. 
I don't think it's complicated. I think if we go back to the Constitution, which is clear about the Congress uh, being the only body uh, in, in our government that can declare war, and then we go to the War Powers Act, and then we move it up to the present, it's absolutely clear. But time and time again, Congress has punted on this because of the politics involved, but they didn't on the Yemen issue, and I think that what you're doing is capturing the moment of the day in what's happening. Um, I wanna make a couple of um, comments that are uh, somewhat political, but not too much. Um, I, mean, I mean, I'm a politician, so, so work with me here. But, so um, here's the thing about members of Congress that I think you're touching on. Everett Dirksen was a senator from the state of Illinois. He was a United States senator. And he once said, when I feel the heat, I see the light, okay? So what you're doing here and what Joe said about 10, 30 people turning into 300 and 300 turning into more is, um, feel, is turning up the heat. And that what you're hoping is that the members of our congressional, de uh, congressional delegation will see the light, okay? That's what this is all about. This is political activism. It starts in rooms like this. It starts in coffee shops. It starts in conversations. It starts in the best way is in a bipartisan way. Now, I understand that uh, members of the Idaho congressional delegation couldn't be here tonight, but I think that you should meet with him. So here's what I would suggest about scheduling. This isn't too political, I'm, I'm, and I'm not opening up any secrets, is that when you request the meeting with a member of Congress, don't say, can they be there on uh, you know, the afternoon of a certain date. Ask when the, the senator is going to be here the next time. When is Senator Risch gonna be here? When is Senator Crapa gonna be here? When is Congressman Simpson? Congressman Simpson was on campus the other day with the Andrews Center and Fulcher and so forth. Ask when they're gonna be here and then say, we'd like to meet with them then. Don't invite them to an event. Say, we will be there. We will be there when they're home. I think one of the failings of our press these days is that we really don't know what our members of Congress are doing. We don't know if they're at, um, you know, Martha's Vineyard, uh, you know, for fundraisers. We don't know if they're, um, uh, when they're home and when they're not home. It's sort of like it's a secret society. And it should not be a secret society. If they don't want to tell us where they are, then they shouldn't be serving in Congress. But they should tell us when they're home. And I wish the statesmen, quite frankly, would publish their schedules when they're coming home, when the recess is, when they're having town meetings and everything. I bet everybody knows when Representative Nichols is having her town meetings out in District 11. And I think the same thing should be true for our members of Congress. It shouldn't be that we just see them every six years. We shouldn't be uh, that we see them in the, the second year of their two-year terms. And, um, and you should be having a meeting with them, Dan, and, and I hope that that happens so that you can talk to them. I know that you got a note from them, uh, from Senator Risch, but, but I, I'm just saying that I think it's important to sit down and talk about this. Let's hear what they have to say firsthand about this. And, and um, you don't need to take uh, you know, people, they don't need to take picket signs, but you need to express where they stand. And, um, and just remember whatever Dirksen said, you know, um, just help our members of Congress see the light on this particular thing. The Constitution should not be a very difficult thing to uh, uh, wrap your arms around and embrace. I think the Constitution is what we should all embrace these days. And I think um, we all know what's in the news these days because the constitutional questions and the role of Congress, the power of Congress, the power of subpoena, and all of that stuff is coming up. But what happened on the vote on Yemen was a very dramatic uh, example of how the Constitution was not followed, I don't believe, in that particular case, especially with a good, strong, bipartisan vote. Um, I think I'm, I'm finished with my remarks. I'll be around for pizza questions and, uh, um, and to meet with anybody and to discuss this issue. But um, uh, Ben, Dan, uh, thank you for your service to our country. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, you're on the front lines, literally. And uh, it's good to have you home. Let's welcome everybody home. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. LaRocco. Our last speaker is Dan McKnight. Uh, he was born and raised here in Boise, Idaho, uh, and he graduated from Capitol High School 
and from Boise State University, so he's about as hometown as it gets. He served 13 years in the military, uh, in the Marine Corps Reserves, U.S. Army, and Idaho National Guard. He is a high school football coach at Rocky Mountain High School, and he is also the founder of this organization, Idahoans, to bring our troops home. Dan. Thank you, Ben. Uh, thanks for being here, everybody. Um, before I get started, um, the smell of the pizza is starting to overtake the room a little bit, so I'll be fairly brief. Um, but before I get to my prepared remarks, I want to uh, recognize a few people who have been working hard to make our efforts a reality. Uh, no movement of any significance uh, can carry its own water without a driving force. Uh, when we first started talking uh, about this, uh, this concept of bringing our troops home, just about 100 days ago, uh, that's how far into this we are. Uh, the very first person I reached out to and discussed this crazy idea was a childhood friend of mine, uh, one of my best friends growing up. We played Little League Baseball at West Boise together. Uh, we played Baseball Capital together. In the fourth grade, during lunch recess, we were on our breakdancing squad together. <laughs> um, we got into a lot of trouble in the neighborhood. Uh, Chris Ho ran for uh, state representative in District 13B in Nampa as a Democrat and had a strong support and a strong showing in a very conservative district. Um, he jumped on board with the cause immediately, and he enjoyed our, uh, joined our very first community forum in February. Uh, ben Adams, who was the MC tonight, a Marine Corps veteran with two tours in Afghanistan. He's currently a member of the Boise State Political Science Association. Um, I was introduced to Ben when I called Kennedy, the, the PSA president, and she referred me to Ben uh, because of his veteran status. He joined our panel at the very first community event and has been a key driving force for our resolution and the upcoming work that we're going to be doing at the State House next session. Uh, Price Robinson, the president of the College Republicans here at Boise State. Price also sat on the panel at that very first meeting, uh, community forum. He's very articulate, he's very well spoken, and his passion for politics and public policy is very clear. Um, he's worked on several campaigns, including the election uh, for Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan. Price, along with his Democratic counterpart, Joe, guarding the pizzas. Um, <laughs> Um, have been very instrumental in creating a bipartisan and cooperative environment in which our community and specifically the campus of Boise State University can work together on this important issue and others in the future. Joe Goody, who is the, the former president of the Boise State Young Democrats, uh, he and Joe co-host the University Pulse radio program, Crossing the Aisle. Uh, Joe and Price are both remarkable in their desire to create a bipartisan dialogue instead of the mudslinging vitriol that seems to dominate our media and our elected officials. Um, Joe has grasped the concept of our efforts and truly sees a way for Idahoans uh, to change the, um, the foreign policy on a world stage. Representative Tammy Nichols, uh, Tammy sat on the panel at our first community forum also. She was in the throes of her very first session in the uh, legislature, but she immediately agreed to work with us. Um, as you heard, she's sponsoring our resolution next legislative session to urge our delegation in DC, uh, and specifically Senator Risch, uh, to advocate for an end of the forever wars. Former Congressman LaRocco, um, who is royalty in the Democratic Party in the state of Idaho, truly a statesman in his service to Idaho and our nation is undeniable. Uh, when we first spoke at the Julian Castro um, meeting a few months ago, you immediately expressed your support, and I appreciate that. Uh, you're a prominent Democrat in the state of Idaho, and having you speak here provides credibility to the bipartisan nature of what we're trying to do, so thank you. And finally, Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan, who can't be here tonight, but Jordan... Jordan in the back is our chief of staff. He's here representing the office. Um, they are working uh, op very openly to help our cause. Uh, Lieutenant Governor welcomed Ben and I into our office uh, with open arms and uh, to discuss our proposed resolution. And she immediately offered her support and she's been very instrumental in helping um, build a bipartisan coalition. These few people that I've mentioned um, are just the beginning of our cause though. Ending the forever wars and bringing our troops home uh, is a growing movement. It's a topic that's in the news every single day. Um, our desire with this meeting and everything else that we have done thus far to bring the attention to our elected congressmen and senators, is prim and primarily Senator Jim Risch, is that Idahoans and Americans are tired of endless wars, and we want to bring our troops home. Uh, you might be sitting here now wondering how in the heck this got started in Idaho. So I'm going to back up just a minute and explain things uh, from where we were about 100 days ago. On January 3rd of this year, Senator Risch was confirmed uh, as the chairman of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. And as the chairman, Senator Risch now holds tremendous power um, and influence over U.S. foreign policy. 
He's probably second in the entire nation next to the President of the United States or maybe the Secretary of State when it comes to foreign policy um, and for our country. Um, the Foreign Relations Committee is charged with leading foreign policy and legislation and debate in the Senate. As we all know, Idaho is a very small state politically. Um, we're very conservative, I would say. Uh, very one color uh, from the political spectrum. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't work in a bipartisan nature. Um, we have access to our senators in Idaho that's exponentially greater than big states. Senator Risch has an office in Boise, Idaho Falls, Pocatello, Twin Falls, Lewiston, and Coeur d'Alene. And you can call his staff and they'll answer your questions and you'll get a response from the senator soon. Uh, it hasn't taken very long to get a response from him at all. Um, you can visit his office, you can schedule meetings with him, and you can visit him at public events in Boise um, if you know when to look for him. And he will take your question and he will talk to you and he will address your concerns. And I did that in February at a Chamber of Commerce event, um, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but it's, it's important for us to organize as citizens of Idaho. And as a group, we're focused on ending the forever wars, and we have leverage here in Idaho, and that's the point of uh, our organization. And we're here to urge Senator Risch to use his chairmanship and tremendous power to advocate for the end of the forever wars in the Middle East. I served in the Marine Corps Reserves, the Army, and the Idaho Army National Guard, and I was deployed to Afghanistan in 2005 through the beginning of 2007. Um, I participated in what was called Operation Enduring Freedom, a very beautiful name for a very ugly war. I was injured in the military after 13 years, and I could no longer serve. Um, I'm healthy now, but I still have a desire to serve. Um, once my military career ended, I felt a desire to work for veterans and veterans' causes and uh, because I felt like we left my brothers and sisters in arms behind. In 2007 and 2008, a fellow soldier, Jimmy Tobias, and myself, we organized a project called Operation Care, uh, where we worked with a group of local realtors to collect essential hygiene items and put them in life-saving care packages um, and send them to the troops in Afghanistan. Specifically, we sent them to the members of the unit that had replaced us the, at the end of our tour. Um, in 2010, I purchased a building in Meridian and remodeled it and turned it into an assisted living home for veterans. So once my mission in the military was over, I've always looked for ways to continue supporting the mission, whatever that mission might be. Today, that mission is to find a way to end the war and bring our troops home. So when Senator Rich was appointed chairman earlier this year, I recognized an opportunity uh, to actively uh, support the, the veterans in America's forever wars. Um, I knew that now is, gonna be, now is the time to go all in, put all my effort and all my time into it, and that's what we've been doing. So that's how our, move, move, our movement began. In just under 100 days, uh, we have grown from a concept into a growing movement with national attention. Um, what started as a simple letter to an editor uh, that was picked up in a lo couple of local newspapers has turned into an active movement with supporters in several states. Um, I wrote down here what we've had. We've had 25 published guest opinion articles from several supporters all across Idaho and Wyoming, including um, a Republican representative, representative, Tyler Lindholm in Wyoming, who um, gave us a nice shout out in a piece that he wrote. We've had multiple community events, including a discussion panel, speaking engagements at the American Legion and VFW halls all across the state of Idaho, radio interviews, television stories, and yesterday's feature front page article on the Idaho Statesman has now been picked up nationally on Stars and Stripes Magazine's website. Our efforts have drawn broad support from Republicans and Democrats, and even support from the very man that we're trying to influence. Senator Risch yesterday in the Statesman said, and I quote, I commend the effort and the advocacy of this important issue, and commend our men and women who have served, who continue to serve in harm's way. Most importantly, we need to end all the wars as quickly as possible in a responsible and thoughtful manner that safeguards our national security interests, preserves our hard fought gains and protects the homeland from those that wish to, uh, to cause us harm. In February, Senator Risch um, said at a Boise Chamber of Commerce event luncheon, when I questioned him publicly, he said, we've spent $2 trillion in Afghanistan. We've shed lots of American blood there. I'm with you. I am through trying to do nation building with countries that simply don't want it. Senator, uh, my name is Dan McKnight from Meridian. Uh, 15 years ago, I was deployed to Afghanistan, and you were the governor of Idaho. And I wrote your letter to the editor. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I agree with you. Thank you. Um, I'm here to ask for your support again. You helped us before. Uh, we couldn't get supplies in Afghanistan, and you were a man of your word and said you would help. Within 48 hours, we had supplies on the way. I came and thanked you in your office. I'm going to ask you for your help again because I think you're a man of integrity. I think you're pro-military, and you're a great Idahoan. 
Recently, uh, Politico had a poll done where 80% of Republican, registered Republicans and 84% of Trump supporters approved of the president's call to bring troops home from Yemen and Syria and Afghanistan specifically. Uh, Stars and Stripe magazine did a poll on Veterans Day where 85% of service members and veterans, the very ones who are called on to fight the wars, agreed that we've been in Afghanistan and Iraq for too long. It's just simply been too long. Recently, you've even said that we won't be the world's policemen, and I, I appreciate that comment. Right now, there's a call to bring the troops home. We've been there for 18 years in Afghanistan. Um, there's a movement. We've got a president who's willing to spend the political capital to bring us home. I happen to live in a great state of Idaho where I can ask my senator personally, face to face, if he'll support this. You sit as the chairman of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, second only to the president and maybe the secretary of the state when it comes to foreign policy. And so I'm here to ask you today, under what situation and what circumstances could you support bringing the troops home from Afghanistan and ending these entangled alliances that have been going on for too long? Yeah, that, that's a great question, and I, and I share your, let me tell you why I share your feelings in, in that regard. You know, after World War II, America did a really, really good job of nation building. We rebuilt Germany, we rebuilt Japan. After the Korean War, we did a really, really great job of building South Korea. and. Uh, those were our experiments in, in nation building, and, and uh, we don't get nearly the credit we should in the world for what we did in those countries. We've been at this now for uh, over the last over two decades of trying to replicate that success in the Middle East. And what do we have to show for it? A goose egg is what we have to show for it. Um, uh, we, we need to focus on America's interests. What are America's interests? Because, look, if you're going to give something to somebody like a gift of democracy, of a free, free market system, of human rights, of the basic rights that are stated in our Bill of Rights and Constitution, they've got to want it. And if they don't want it, it doesn't matter how much you shovel at them, it ain't going to happen. We've spent $2 trillion now uh, in Afghanistan. And uh, we've shed uh, lots and lots of American blood there. Um, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I am through trying to do nation building with countries that don't want it. They've got to show some type of an appreciation. He made a policy statement at a Boise luncheon um, in our own district, and it's, it's barely making the news. In his heart, I believe that Senator Risch believes, as we do, that we need to end the forever wars, bring our troops home, and that Congress needs to reclaim their authority to commit to uh, U.S. military to combat operations. However, Right before he made those comments, and immediately after, and in fact three times in 90 days, he has voted to keep troops in conflicts in the Middle East indefinitely, thereby providing no immediate opportunity to end the forever wars. So that's the platform of our movement. And I'm going to repeat it so that there's no mistake. We need to end the forever wars. We need to bring our troops home. And we need to reclaim Congress's authority to commit U.S. military to combat operations. I want to define a few key terms real quick so that we can understand why this is not a Republican or a Democrat position. It's an American and a constitutional um, position. First, we all understand that there are multiple ways that the U.S. military can become involved in a war um, or armed conflicts or combat operations or whatever the term of the day is. First, Congress holds the power. Congressman LaRocco talked about that. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution declares that the House of Representatives is the only body authorized to declare war. This may be done through a formal declaration, which they did in 1941 and again in 1942 on a lesser known scale. Um, it can be done on a roll call vote, a joint resolution, or an authorization of use of military force, which is called an AUMF. That's kind of the, the term we're hearing in the media these days. Number two, the president, using the War Powers Resolution of 1973, which is Title 50 of the US Code, can commit military to an armed conflict without consent from Congress. Uh, it requires the president to notify Congress within 48 hours and forbids armed forces from remaining for more than 60 days plus an additional 30 days to withdraw. Um, the only way to extend that war powers is through a congressional AUMF or a formal declaration of war. So Congress last declared war in 1942 when it recognized Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria, Axis powers under the control of Nazi Germany, as enemies in World War II. Ever since Congress abdicated its constitutional responsibility, for declaring, declaring and providing oversight of wars, the US presidents, Republican and Democrats alike, 
have near dictator-like oversight of wars, limitless power over foreign affairs. Since the last time Congress declared war in World War II, somewhere north of 100,000 American troops have been killed and several hundred thousand more have been injured. American troops have died in foreign wars without an authorization from the representatives that were elected to send them there. This should be a huge story. It should be the proverbial elephant in the room. It should be the largest national scandal, but it's not. Precious few Americans bear the burden of waging war on Uncle Sam for Uncle Sam. Middle class and lower class uh, children are the ones that sign up for the military. We no longer have a draft. And so the, the conscience of America has kind of gone by the wayside. The populace quit caring about what's done in its name overseas. Uh, the U US involvement in the Korean War, and we have a Korean War veteran in the back, thank you, sir, for your service, began with a United Nations Security Council resolution. It didn't even start in the United States. 54,000 Americans died in Korea, another 58,000 perished in Vietnam over the course of more than two decades. U.S. involvement in Southeast Asia covered Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, and the Ford presidencies combined, all without a formal declaration of war from Congress. Other military actions since the Second World War um, include the Gulf War, actions in Somalia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Kosovo, and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Operations have now spread all across the Middle East and Africa, with active combat operations ongoing in Yemen, Syria, Niger, Mali, Mauritania, Cameroon, Saudi Arabia, and Tanzania. We have U.S. military bases um, under the, the leapfrog strategy where we set up a small base to fight terrorism um, going, in and going on all across Africa, Botswana, Senegal, Ghana, Central African Republic, Libya, Tunisia, Bahrain, UAE, Oman, Djibouti, Mozambique, and over 80 nations have military presence to do what's called mission creep, all under the label of the war on terror and none of it has been authorized by Congress. So it's true. 2001, we were attacked. We suffered a tremendous blow. Our response was swift, it was decisive, it was appropriate. We went after the very people who planned and executed the attacks. Both the House and the Senate passed SJ Resolution 23 on September 14th, 2001, which authorized the use of the United States Armed Forces against those responsible for the attacks on September 11th, and those associated forces who aided them. The authorization granted the president the authority to use all necessary and appropriate force. President Bush signed um, the AUMF, and it was immediately interpreted that it provided congressional authorization to the president as a blank check to use any and all necessary force over any ex extended period of time. It gave unlimited powers to wage war without debate. The AUMF is now provide, has now provided cover for the executive branch to creep our mission around the globe under the pretense of fighting the war on terror. Congress has literally and figuratively castrated itself in regards to the enumerated powers of declare, to declare war. The executive branch over the past six decades, 60 years, has morphed into an emperor with supreme control of the military. And it has happened without or with the willing consent of the Congress the very body that's designed to check their powers, they've willingly gave it away. And just to be clear, this is not the way it's supposed to be. The 2001 AUMF has not been voted on by 90% of the current members of the House of Representatives. And the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations has previously held hearings about the need for a new AUMF. I couldn't agree more. It's time for a new, a new AUMF. It's time to pull back on the reins and define the objective that would allow for a responsible withdrawal from troops from these endless wars. So our mission on the 2001 AUMF was to, uh, to go after and kill anybody who attacked us on September 11th. It was, the purpose was to go after anybody that aided those that attacked us on September 11th. And the purpose was to kill Osama bin Laden and destroy the terror training camps um, where the plan was hatched. When I left in 2007, every single person that attacked us on September 11th was dead. Nearly every single person that aided those that attacked us was captured or killed. A few years after I left, Osama bin Laden was killed by Navy SEALs in Pakistan. Almost every single terrorist organization that existed on September 11, 2001 has been destroyed and is no longer a figure on the battlefield. Our mission has been accomplished. But 18 years later, we're still there doing active nation building. We're supporting a corrupt Afghan government. We're building infrastructure and attempting to win the hearts and minds. It's my argument that this is not the mission of the US military. 
The will of the American people to end the forever wars and bring our troops home seems to be reflected in a political poll that was done in January, which found that 56% of registered voters supported President Trump's proposed withdrawal of troops from Syria, which included 71% of registered Republicans. A Smithsonian and Stars and Stripes magazine poll found that 86% of veterans and active military members believed that the war in Afghanistan had simply gone on for too long. And in a brand new poll that was just released today, as I was driving in the parking garage, I found it. Um, by the Concerned Veterans for America found that 60% of those questioned would totally support the president if he were to authorize that all troops be withdrawn from Afghanistan. The desire to find a reasonable and immediate end to the forever wars is also supported by every single Democratic U.S. Senator that is currently running for president. And that's quite a few. <laughs> Other candidates like Representative Tulsi Gabbard from Hawaii have made this their number one issue. Um, we hope that Tulsi gets a little bit of traction on this, uh, that she, she is a veteran herself and her position is that we should be ending these forever wars and stop involving ourselves in regime changes. So our mission here tonight with the Boise State University Young Democrats, where's Joe back there, and the college Republicans, Representative Nichols, former Representative uh, Congressman LaRocco, constituents of Senator Risch, concerned citizens, and all of our followers watching on Facebook Live is to find unity in this single issue is to stand together as Idahoans and as patriots and to urge our elected leaders and specifically Senator Jim Risch from the great state of Idaho to use his tremendous power as the chairman of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations to advocate for an immediate end of the forever wars. Now's the time, sometime this year or maybe next year, we're gonna hear in the media of a soldier, a sailor, or an airman or a Marine that's going to die in Afghanistan that wasn't even born when the war began. An entire generation of Americans and many of the young college students in this room today have never known a moment in their life when America wasn't at war. Let that sink in for a moment. An American soldier will die in a war that started before he or she was ever born. So we have a petition that I'm going to ask you to sign right now. Go ahead, pull out your smartphones and go to www.bringourtroopshome.us. Go ahead, I'll wait. <laughs> Go to the site and sign our petition expressing your support for the, for the responsible and immediate withdrawal from the forever wars. I promise your information will not be shared and our petition is growing and we are going to submit it to Senator Rich very soon. We have the opportunity to etch a page in history that will forever remember Idaho as being the catalyst for the end of these forever wars. But it can only happen with your support. Please share our page, follow us on social media, sign our petition and share with your friends. I'm gonna repeat this that's already been said once tonight, but in the State of the Union address, President Trump said, great nations do not fight endless wars. It's time to give our brave warriors a warm welcome home. Thank you for coming tonight and let's bring our troops home. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for the people that are watching live and online. I hope you all have a wonderful evening and enjoy the pizza. Oh, there are also t-shirts in the back. Uh, you should be able to find your size if you'd like one. Thanks. <laughs>